So welcome to all of you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight uh, in support of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, featuring doctors Christy Teal and Rachel Brem. I'm Sherry Werb, director of the Library of Congress's Public and Professional Programming Division called the Center for Learning, Literacy, and Engagement. I'm also a 17-year breast cancer survivor with great appreciation for these two doctors who have been involved with my own care. Thank you for coming. This program is part of our Live at the Library series where we keep the Thomas Jefferson Building open late on Thursday nights. I encourage you to explore the library's exhibits, architecture, amazing views, and grab something to eat and drink tonight or on future Thursday nights. There's always something happening here at the library on Thursday evenings. Um, but now to tonight's program and our distinguished authors. I'm honored to be on stage tonight with Dr. Rachel Brem, who is the professor and director of breast imaging and intervention at George Washington University, vice chairman of their department of radiology, and chief medical advisor and co-founder of the Brehm Foundation. She is a fellow of the American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging and has been instrumental in developing and implementing new technologies to improve breast care detection. Dr. Brehm is joined on stage by Dr. Christy Teal, the director of the Breast Care Center and chief of breast surgery at George Washington University Medical Faculty Associates, as well as an associate professor of surgery. Since joining the faculty at George Washington University in 2001, Dr. Teal and her colleagues have developed a cutting edge, holistic, patient focused breast care center that integrates complementary medicine with the latest technology and surgical innovations. She's dedicated to performing clinical and translational research with the goal of improving patient outcomes. She has a special interest in taking care of breast cancer patients and those at increased risk for it. I'm going to be asking Dr. Bram and Teal about their book and their work, but we're leaving time at the end for all of you to ask questions. This is a welcoming space and your questions can get as detailed as you'd like them to be. At the end of the event, our authors will sign their book. So, good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, it's great to have you here. And so to get started, uh, both of you are leaders in the field of breast cancer treatment, and both of you write in the book about your own breast care, breast cancer experience. Could you tell us a bit about your own experiences and why you made the decisions that you did? Uh, so uh, breast cancer has been part of my every fiber since I was 12 when my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, we were told that she had six months to live. She lived 44 years. So that was my first um, experience with the impact of early detection. Um, my mother had many recurrences and, uh, and never quite was the same vibrant, redheaded, fill the room person after the diagnosis. But it was at that point that I decided that I wanted to go into medicine so that other 12-year-olds wouldn't have to deal with what our family dealt with. Um, but it was interesting that at that point, um, my parents had never met a woman doctor, and they thought that that was a very bad idea. Um, I'm an immigrant. My, my parents moved here to the United States after um, I was born, and um, it just wasn't part of what they did. So um, you know, I was just dedicated to going to medical school which I did. I went to Columbia, and it was, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it was a very exciting time in the 1980s when mammography was first being used, and we were first identifying that mammography was decreasing the death rate from breast cancer, and those studies were actually done in New York, so we were surrounded by it. And then I went on to um, become the uh, director of breast imaging, and um, while trying out some ultrasound equipment, found my own breast cancer one evening at the age of 37. So history was repeating itself. And one of the things that I learned at that time was that um, I was, felt so sorry for my patients, felt so lucky when I was diagnosed with breast cancer because I knew what I needed to know. My vat of information was filled, but I couldn't even imagine how women were making these profound 
decisions um, not having the kind of knowledge base that I was dealing with every day in my, in, at work. And um, so uh, I decided to have prophylact uh, to, to have breath, uh, mastectomies. Um, what I failed to tell you is that I had found out that I was BRCA1 positive shortly before this and had scheduled prophylactic mastectomies. And between scheduling it um, and having the surgery, found that it wasn't prophylactic, it was for cancer. So um, I then you know, was more zealous and more determined to impact uh, breast cancer and make, make an impact on breast cancer. And so um, you know, that is my story, and it was pretty much the rest is history that we've de uh, you know, I've devoted my life to trying to develop uh, the best care for patients, new technologies, and um, have had so many silver linings, not the least of which is worth working with Christy. So it's been, um, you know, it's given me passion. It's been difficult, but it's given me passion and um, also uh, a focus and a, and a desire to make a difference, an overwhelming desire to make a difference. So um, the good and the bad of breast cancer. So I'm going to start with why I always wanted to write a book with Rachel, and you just heard it. Quite an incredible story. Um, talk about a pioneer for women trying to make that decision about whether to have mastectomies. In 1996, when she had made that decision, nobody was doing preventive mastectomies. Remember, the gene was only identified in 1994, so it was all brand new. Um, and so I first became personally involved with breast cancer in 1997 when my mother was diagnosed um, with breast cancer and a month later my best friend was diagnosed. And so it became my passion. I was a young attending at Andrews Air Force Base and um, very quickly over those four years realized that that was definitely the direction that I wanted my career to go. And I joined 2000, GW in 2001, and that's when I met Rachel. Um, <clears throat> Ten years later, my mother was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of breast cancer, and that's when we learned that her aunt had died at a very young age of breast cancer, and I became concerned about my risk. Um, she tested negative for a BRCA gene, so I didn't have that as my guidance, so I used my family history as my guidance to make a difficult decision to have preventive mastectomies. I knew I did not want the fate that my mother was going to have. But during that process, I met with a lot of resistance, resistance that Rachel had met with back in 1996. And I couldn't understand why in 2011, I was meeting resistance from physicians who I was not asking their opinion. I was actually just informing them of the decision that I had made. And I wondered how many women were, who didn't have the knowledge that we have, were experiencing that from physicians being told, no, you don't need to do that, and not being given that option. And so I did a, a louder reporter from the Washingtonian to follow me for six months. And in 2000, July of 2011, the article Christie's Choice came out in the Washingtonian. And it helped so many women that I really wanted to be able to reach many, many more. And I knew a book was going to be the way to do it. And when the pandemic, <laughs> pandemic started, I said, Rachel, it's time. Yeah. One more thing about the reason we wrote the book, if I may, Shari, if that, that's OK. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, uh, we also realized that there's really nobody who has the perspective that we have. You know, we are the daughters of women who um, succumbed to breast cancer. Um, we are uh, women, I had breast cancer, bilateral mastectomies, chemotherapy. Christy um, made very profound choices herself. And we are experts in the field and deal with um, uh, patients every day. And we have daughters. So we had a 360 degree view as the patient, as the expert, as the daughter, as the mother. And we wanted to arm women with the information they needed to make the best decision for them. And that's different for every person. Um, make the best decision for them with the real information they needed to make that decision. Well, since you have this 360 degree view, I'm just wondering how that affects your work with patients. I, I think that we, what 
our goal, and the goal with the book, but our goal every day when we're meeting with patients is to educate and empower, give women the information and their families the information that they need so that they can make the decision that is right for them. It's not our job to make the decision about what's right for them, but we want to give all of the information. And then if they decide that mastectomy is the direction to go or breast conservation, then we're there to be their advocate. And you know, there is nothing in medicine that um, the patient has to make so many profound decisions. You know, you have a strep throat, you get an antibiotic, right? You have a slip disc that needs surgery of surgery. People don't ask you, you know, do you want surgery on the right side of your spine or the left side? But with breast cancer, that's not the way it is. Do you want a lumpectomy? Do you want a mastectomy? Well, I really don't want it either. I really don't want to have breast cancer. But here you are making the decision and then meeting with a, a oncologist, they'll say, well, your risk reduction goes down by so many percentage if you have chemotherapy. And, and I can't even imagine how they make that decision. So um, I think having breast cancer and having the knowledge that women really need to make that decision, I, I hope gives us um, the opportunity to help women in ways that perhaps others can. You certainly don't need every disease to be a good doctor. But, um, but I do think the perspective helps us, uh, and I don't want to say guide, but guide people, women, families, the people they, that love them to the decision that's best for them. And one of the things, even though the title of the book is Understanding Mastectomies, we are not at all pro-mastectomies. We are pro-choice. We are pro-knowledge. We are pro-knowledge is power to give women what they need to know because so many times they don't know what they would have needed to know until afterwards. So give them the opportunity to know um, how they would come to the decision of what's best for them through this, through the book. You started to mention about how, you know, you're given all of these choices uh, when you're diagnosed. And when you are diagnosed, you're, you know, you're entering into this new world, this new vocabulary, having to make choices about practical things, about medical things. Um, in this book, you talk about tips, you know, in sort of engaging with your professionals and others. Do you want to share some of these with us? Well, we included um, questions at the very end. Um, you can find questions on the internet, of course, but we felt that we really wanted to tailor questions and we preface it that your provider, let your provider speak to you first because perhaps they'll answer all of those questions. But um, we thought that having that as just a, a guide um, for women before they go into their various appointments may find it helpful. Um, I love the screening chapter. There's so many great recommendations, um, and I, maybe you can touch on that. It's it, there's so many things changing. Right. So screening is so confusing. Every organization recommends something different, and you know we really just want to let everybody who reads the book know um, that you have to get screened every year, regardless of what organization. Everybody agrees that the data is compelling and overwhelming, that screening every year is the way to go to save the most lives. And the death rate from breast cancer has gone down 40% over the past two decades. So shame on us if we go backwards and only, you know, the USPSTF that recommends every other year, gratefully, they changed their recommendation this year to start at 40 instead of what was before, which is 50. And they say, you know, if you do it every other year, will you maintain 81% of the, of the mortality reduction? Well, you know, raise your hand if you want to be one of the 19% who succumbs because of this um, ill, ill thought out uh, decision. So um, that's one thing. I mean, I'd have to say uh, that my, maybe my favorite chapter is when, um, my husband, who's here, was writing, when I was in the throes of writing the book, we were on vacation, and I mean, I was 37 when I had breast cancer, and he was my rock, and he came up to me and he said, do you have a chapter for the life partner of someone who has breast cancer? And I sort of looked at him and I said, uh, now we do, you know, it, and it just has the perspective of, everyone's perspective on breast cancer and disease is so different. So I think that that's really helpful, what others can do, you know, I mean, um, 
So often people feel the loved ones that, that are supporting women going through breast cancer feel guilty, that they feel sorry for themselves, but they have so much to deal with as well. I mean, you know, for our family, was Henry going to have to raise three daughters by himself? Um, but uh, gratefully not, and you know, two out of the three are here, um, and many of our grandchildren. So uh, it's, yeah, I think it's just the perspective of what you really need to know. And, and what I love, when people talk to us about the book, what I love is that they describe it as comprehensive and compassionate um, and, and informative, and that's really what we wanted it to be. You were, st you, you were saying that your, um, one of your favorite chapters is on the screening, and you focus on screening prevention and treatment, and there has been great news in all three of those areas. What, what are you most excited about in terms of some of the advancements that we're seeing right now? I think we're just doing so much better with targeted therapy, and the ultimate goal is targeted therapy or therapy for patients, improving survival while really reducing side effects. Um, nobody enjoys chemotherapy. Rachel can say it. Many people can attest to the fact that chemotherapy is really miserable. But if there can be more targeted therapy that has less symptoms, then it's a big win. Um, the greatest reduction in mortality has been because of screening, and we're so lucky to have these really incredibly talented radiologists working every day, and Jocelyn Rapelier is here, who was were working with Rachel on pioneering 3D ultrasound, which is so important now for women with dense breast tissue. Um, so we're, we're making strides every day, but boy, we're not where we need to be yet. You know, I have to say, I remember looking at my mother who really had mutilating surgery in the 70s, and now, you know, even personally, you know, after having three kids, everything was sort of going south, and you wake up from reconstruction looking like Barbie. So, um, so you know, it, we, we have, sp and, but also everything has changed. When I had my breast cancer, anyone who had a one centimeter cancer got chemotherapy. And now we have molecular markers for your individual cancer, whether chemotherapy will help you. And if it doesn't, we don't give it anymore. But I'd say my hope is that um, our grandchildren will read about it in the history books like polio, you know, that it's something they know about but they don't experience with gene therapy. And I think even early detection, you know, I mean, um, Jocelyn is working, you know, we have so much pushback. I think that's another thing that's very different about breast cancer, maybe because it's with women. I'm not sure exactly why, but uh, Jocelyn Rapelier is working on proving that uh, self-exam is really important and she's working on this huge project on how did people get diagnosed how did women get diagnosed the method of detection and i think that'll finally be the you know the definitive scientific information that's really needed um, to encourage women to do everything they can to find early curable breast cancer and the last thing that's of course very important is that largely early breast cancer is indeed curable all right, 95 plus percent of women with early stage breast cancer survive and thrive. Okay, well now you've all been looking at the image on the screen, um, probably, and um, we've selected some of these images from our collection. Um, we're here at the Library of Congress. Um, there are always many resources for you in general, but if you are looking for information about breast cancer, you can also look here at the library. Um, our science and business reading room um, created these slides for us and they selected some images that reinforce messages from the book that breast cancer is not a medieval process uh, dictated to the patient, but one that the patient can take charge of. Um, so I am going to go through the slides. I know uh, you've looked at them in advance and have some things to say about them. So why don't we start with this first slide here. Yeah, so the first couple of slides are um, surgeons, so I'm going to talk about them since I'm a surgeon. Um, <clears throat> so William Nisbet, Scottish physician, he was part of the Royal College of Surgeons, so that's how I figured out he's a surgeon. There's just not much history about him, 
Um, he was, uh, he lived from 1759 to 1822, but his real focus was on the prevention and cure of diseases. So I think he would definitely approve of our book because that's a large focus of it. We have an entire chapter devo devoted to uh, women with genetic mutations and another one for family history and um, uh, other books were on the treatise of diet, so he was definitely way ahead of his time. So William Halstead, anybody who um, is a surgeon knows all about William Halstead. He was, he lived 1852 to 1922. Um, the first mastectomy performed under um, any kind of anesthesia was in 1804 in Japan. Before then, in the 1700s, there were some mastectomies being performed, but they were not with anesthesia. Um, but Halstead performed the first um, radical mastectomy. Before then, survival rates were less than 20%, so really abysmal. So he was really trying to achieve cure. Um, the radical mastectomies in the beginning involved removing not only the breast, but the muscle, the pectoralis major muscle, all of the skin and the lymph nodes. Um, he didn't do skin grafts initially. Um, ultimately, after some time, he did start doing skin grafts. It was quite mutilating, I think. Did your mom? Mm -hmm. Yeah. She had a radical. Her mother had a radical. Um, but he performed a paper or he published a paper of his performance. Um, it was all the mastectomies from 19, or 1889 to um, 1894, and he was able to show a 50% survival rate, which was quite an improvement. Okay, and then this final surgeon, um, Dr. White, um, he was the one who introduced saving the skin. So rather than removing all the skin and performing skin grafts, he was able to show that you could save the skin so that you could do a more cosmetic closure, often by including a plastic surgeon. And the conclusion of um, one of his papers, it wasn't this particular one, was that having a more cosmetic um, closure did not increase local recurrence and was therefore safe. And I think this paper was in 1930. Um, so he was quite a pioneer, as now we do everything that we can to improve cosmetic um, results. It went from skin-sparing mastectomies, and now we're doing safely nipple-sparing mast mastectomies and really trying to make women look as natural as possible. So thanks. So uh, this is um, from 1936, 37. Um, and it's really sort of a prophetic, uh, educating and targeting information about breast cancer for women. Um, and it's interesting that the first mammograms were performed in 1913 on specimens, and in the 40s they started performing mammograms on breasts because they had high-resolution film uh, that Kodak had developed. And then Robert Egan, sort of the, the founder of mammography, uh, reported the first improvement in survival as a result of mammography and the ability to see cancers um, on mammograms. And so now um, we know that education is power, knowledge is power, that um, early detection is key, and it really speaks to the Brent Foundation. It's a nonprofit that we started 20 years ago, um, focusing on early detection. And my daughter, Andrea Wolf, who's here, was the CEO of that for six years um, and um, moved on to other things about two years ago. But I think that this is really prophetic, beginning to really educate women in the 70s um, and, and understanding that even here, early detection saves lives because it really talks about the ability to save life with being aware of breast cancer. Um, this is really, I, th I thought this was really important um, and I think it really speaks to why we wrote the book and why the Brem Foundation is here and why there's so many support 
um, mechanisms for women with breast cancer that you don't have to fight it alone. And we really have to thank Betty Ford, you know, uh, the wife of the of Gerald Ford, who really made um, breast cancer not taboo. She spoke about it. She uh, made it um, not shameful. And, um, and I think now we have support systems, and I think it's really extraordinary that um, even this early uh, image uh, talks about agency support, advice, and now, you know, in, in, in the Army. Um, so it's the pre predecessor for the American Cancer Society, what they call the American Society for the Control of Cancer, but um, it was really sort of the uh, spark that you don't, you're not alone, um, that it is something we can talk about and things we can learn about. So, um, and, and it, you know, it really is mission aligned with why we wrote No Longer Radical. So this is interesting, you know, doing breast self-examination is so controversial. I mean, Christy and I every day see women who find their own breast cancer. And without self-exam, it would be found, but it would be found when it was larger later and more advanced. And it sort of perplexes us why uh, now the current recommendation is not to do self-exam. And it's hard to understand why. It's free, it's uh, available, it's easy. And, um, and you know, Jocelyn Repelier is doing this study on MOD, method of detection, that I think will really prove that breast self-examination, particularly in younger women with dense breasts where mammography can be less effective, um, can really be life-saving. So, you know, I think um, it, was, it was a great, it, it was great that it was introduced. Um, not sure exactly why there's pushback on it, even with the USPSTF recommendations. But, Ma, you know, um, nobody knows you as well as you know you. And if you don't advocate and raise your voice for what you know is wrong with you, then your life is, can, be, can well be on, on, um, on the line. So um, I think this uh, really speaks to self-advocacy, whether it's to get additional screening if you have dense breast or whether it's a study that you need that your insurance company might not cover. It really is all about self-advocacy, starting with breast self-examination. You've mentioned a couple times about breast density, um, and there's some politics around that. Can you, can you talk about that? Oh, I love to talk about that. <laughs> so dense breast tissue is how much white tissue you have on a mammogram. Really, you can't tell by exam. And the reason density is so important is because um, breast cancer on a mammogram is white and breast tissue is white, so you lose the contrast. And although mammography is still important with women with dense breasts, in women with dense breasts, um, the efficacy of mammography is substantially less. But the other piece to that is that women who have dense breast tissue are at markedly increased risk of developing breast cancer. So it's kind of the perfect storm, higher risk, harder to find. But we do have technologies um, that uh, can find these hidden cancers. And they're super important cancers. And you'd say every cancer is important, but these are particularly important because they're the ones we find with this additional screening, whether it's ultrasound, MRI, molecular breast imaging, ultrasound tomography, we've got lots of tools in our tool chest, are small node negative killer cancers that if we find them early are really important. And um, one of the things I want to say before we get to the politics of it, but you know, when we talk about breast cancer, we always talk about survival. But we really have to talk about one more thing, which is intensity of care. What journey did that woman have to take to get to survival? And having less aggressive surgery, less aggressive chemotherapy with or without radiation therapy is a much better journey than when everything is aggressive, even if the end result is the same, which is survival. So. Now, uh, breast density is political. Um, there are now uh, 36 states in the District of Columbia that have laws that require women be told what their breast density is. The, F uh, the um, FDA uh, published wording, which by law has to go into effect in September 2024, that will require every American woman to know what her breast density is. And 
Um, and it says, unfortunately, it didn't go far enough. It says, talk to your healthcare provider about whether you need additional screening. And really what it should have said is, if you have dense tissue, you do need additional screening. Um, so that's it. Plus there are um, a number of laws that have been passed. The Service Act was passed recently for uh, veterans and military that requires 3D, the newest form of mammography for service people, and um, molecular testing and genetic testing to be covered. But the problem is that since the American, um, the Affordable Care Act, screening mammography is free, no, co no copay, no deductible. But the additional tests that women need, if you do have dense breast, is not. And so there's a huge issue with healthcare disparity with breast cancer. Uh, underserved women, black women die at a much higher rate than white women. And um, affluent women, and so if a woman has to decide between buying dinner for her family or getting a screening ultrasound because she has dense breasts, um, that's a terrible decision that shouldn't have to be made. So there is something called the Early Act that's been introduced by Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro and uh, Congressman Patrick, uh, Patrick Fitzgerald, Fitzpatrick, um, where the additional testing will also be covered, um, and uh, we don't think it's going to pass in this Congress, we hope it does, but there are now 12 states in the District of Columbia that have state laws that require uh, insurance coverage of this additional testing to find these hidden cancers. So, um, but I do have to say, you know, I'm so grateful to uh, the media and to people who speak about this because when the Brem Foundation first started and we would do educational programs and you would say, start out by saying, what's the number one risk factor for breast cancer? People, the risk, number one risk factor is being a woman, but people would say it's family history. And now, so frequently when we do these programs, the number one thing people say is breast density. So I think we've been, you know, we're making headway in terms of education, risk-based screening, um, but we have to be able to have health equity um, and, uh, and allow all women in the United States to have high-quality mammography and additional essential screening if they have dense breast tissue. Thank you. Um, well, another kind of controversial um, section of your book is titled, Mastectomy Does Not Improve Survival. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, so, and... You know, there's a big push in the surgical world to make sure that we emphasize that to our patients when they're diagnosed with breast cancer, that studies over all these years have shown that whether you do breast conservation, which is um, lumpectomy, or we call it partial mastectomy, followed by radiation, does not have an improved survival over doing mastectomy. So. For most patients who are candidates for breast conservation, that's generally what the recommendation is. Um, the increased risk of a new cancer is greater in a woman diagnosed with breast cancer, so we quote the increased rate is anywhere from 0.5 to 1% per year. So that's about 30% in the next 30 years. Um, the medications we use to treat patients, though, reduce that risk. So. When we're talking to a patient, we need to discuss that, but then we also need to take into account if they have a genetic mutation. And of course, now it's widely accepted that if a patient has a genetic mutation when she's diagnosed with breast cancer, to discuss doing bilateral mastectomies. What isn't so much taken into account is if there's a strong family history of breast cancer or if there's other abnormal findings, extremely dense breast tissue, need for many additional MRI-guided biopsies. Some of those patients prefer the option of having bilateral mastectomies. And so survival is definitely one component of it, and we make sure to educate, but then we like to empower so that the woman can make the decision that's best for her. Okay, well, we have um, time for question and answer from the audience. So I wanted to see if anybody here has a question. She saw her oncologist, and it was a long delay. There, she's in Florida, in, in St. Petersburg, and um, the healthcare does not seem to be 
as dynamic and targeted as it should be because you know, be, every appointment is a week or two out when you know after she got her screening and they had found you know you know they found the she the the mammography and the ultrasound and they had found it and then it took like three weeks to be able to get an appointment with um, the doctor, and then and then the doctors had to go to the oncologist. So it, it seemed like all this time, right, had had gone by, and um, so right now, you know, she's got an appointment on October 27th. She's 80, uh, 85 years old, um, and she and she was um, she's been a lifelong Christian scientist which adds a little, you know, an element of interest, you know, to how the fact that she let things go for so long. Um, she had felt a lump and then it had grown, but she didn't tell anybody. Um, and, and so um, my question is, is in terms of, you know, she doesn't like to talk about her medical situation. It's very difficult for her um, to express herself, but, um, you know, I, I would like to know, if, you know your opinion in terms of the statistics of what, should you know uh, you know what works best for the surgery for an 85 year old person um, to be able to have the best recovery possible? Is she in a healthy? She actually is healthy. That's what we look at. We don't. No, really but one one final thing: she she had a coughing for about eight weeks that you know that was like was very bad and we didn't know what it was and then we finally kind of figured out that there was potentially a connection between like you know because we thought it may have been long-term covid right but so th that was another thing that that was alarming but then once we did find out um, so when it comes to surgery we always look at really the how the patient looks we don't really look at the age um, but we also have to look at whether it's resectable, and so it may be that it's involving the chest wall, in which case we'd end up recommending medication to try to shrink it. Um, if there's spread to her lung, if that's the cause of her, her cough, mm -hmm. then it's more of a medical management, not so much surgical. And breast cancer is hundreds of diseases. You know, it's very hard to address that because you know, we look at the pathology, we look at the molecular uh, fingerprint of the cancer. Every cancer is different. And so it's very hard to, you know, I, I know that you love your mother and you really want her to get the best care, but it's really hard, impossible right. for us without knowing the nuances of what her care is mm -hmm. to address what's best. Mm -hmm. um, we can certainly help you and find places in Florida that might work, mm -hmm. you know, we can do it. The Brun Foundation is happy to help with those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But in terms of specifically what your mom needs, um, you know, it's very hard to address that now. But chapter three is a really nice descriptive chapter. Um, we called it Cancer 101 when we were first writing the book and it kind of walks you through the pathology report and what it all means. And that might be helpful for you. Thank you very and much. And we wish her good health and good luck. Okay, thank you. Hi. Can you talk about the use of AI and what you do? So AI is artificial intelligence, and it's, um, it's constantly learning from mammograms. And the data is extremely compelling that um, AI functions um, essentially as well as subspecialized breast imagers. So um, we know that with the use of AI, we can use the expertise of, it's not instead of radiologists, it's with them. And uh, with the use of AI together with the experience of the radiologist, we can find cancers earlier and smaller. But I think for me, uh, part of the most exciting thing about AI um, is that it may really help us impact healthcare disparity because the healthcare in underserved communities and black communities is often, the radiology is often done by general radiologists that are in, in situations that are less funded. And we have studies that have shown us that general radiologists can function as well as 
um, subspecialized breast imagers with the use of AI. So it may be an opportunity, both in the United States and outside of the United States, to bring a higher level of expertise and the opportunity to find earlier, more curable breast cancers. Um, and the other thing is that, uh, you know, we have AI in our practice, uh, you know, uh, I and Dr. Pellier use it every day on every case. But um, what we're finding is when you have AI and it's learning from each case that it sees, that um, it has a score. And now what we're learning is that we have a threshold for abnormal, but when you look at mammograms of years earlier, that I'm just making a number up, but if the threshold is 50, last year's was normal, but it was 40. And the year before that, it was normal, but it was 30. So I think it's gonna be a lot like PSA, where we're gonna be able to use trends to find breast cancer even earlier by not having an absolute number. And the other thing is that there's an enormous amount of um, individualized information proteomics that we can glean from a mammogram to help with risk assessment. So it could be really helpful to use what we call short-term risk. What's my risk of getting breast cancer in the next three to five years as opposed to a lifetime risk so that we can allocate resources to those that are gonna get breast cancer soon and maybe not use those very precious resources if someone isn't gonna get breast cancer for 20 years. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in risk management, risk assessment, resource allocation, and impacting the real huge healthcare disparity that we see in the United States overall, but certainly with breast cancer. I have a question, um, just, just as a follow-up to the, to the first gentleman's question. You know, Dr. Brim, you, you, you mentioned how uh, more advanced we are with the media and all the messaging around breast cancer. But what, what do you do when you have a patient who comes and is just really reluctant to talk about breast cancer, either because of faith or culture or whatever reason? How, how do you sort of approach that? You know, one of the things we try to do is culturally sensitive medicine. And um, there are certain cultures where um, getting undressed is much, even just that is so much more difficult, um, you know, talking about cancer. So we really try to use our experience to understand what culture these people are coming from and how we can use what we know about different cultural sensitivities. Plus there are many support groups. Plus the other thing we do is we never um, allow families to interpret when the patients come in because we don't know what they're saying and there are cultures that they never use the word cancer and you know I'll say you know this is a very large cancer and they could be saying everything's fine and I have no way of knowing so you know we try to really think at the patient at the center of everything but also it's their information and um, and that's really critical in a culturally sensitive way but you know, it's not only the diagnosis, it's also clinical trials, right? So black Americans appropriately have had historically supported, um, uh, you know, suspicions of clinical trials, right? Tuskegee, there's so many things. And yet we need underserved uh, people under, in underserved communities to be part of clinical trials because we can't use targeted molecular medicine if we, they're not participating. And every genetic population has different um, uh, fingerprints, right? I mean, I'm an Ashkenazi Jew. We have the BRCA gene is 10 times more frequent. You know, it's one in 400 in the overall population. It's one in 40 in our population. So we do look at both screening and discussions and information um, in a culturally sensitive way, but always putting the patient in the center of it to make sure that they get the information they need. Are there any other questions? Well, I'm not a survivor, because I had preventive mastectomies. So 
there's all sorts of terms for um, if you've had preventive mastectomies, one that's commonly used in the force, which is a, a big support group for women with a genetic mutation. We, they call us previvors. So, um, but I think um, there's so many areas of providing support, right? And it just depends on each individual person, whether for me, um, I really didn't need help from my husband, but what I really wanted was my kids to be taken care of, and he made sure that my kids were taken care of so I could just rest and recover. So that's just like one small example, and um, so many others when women are going through chemotherapy, and you know, I'll let Rachel comment on some of that. Um, so each woman has her own individual needs as she's going through treatment, and it's mostly just communicating about what her particular need might be. I mean, and I, I would add to that, you know, if there's one piece of advice, I'd say listen, because everybody needs something different. Um, and uh, and pe it, it, people will tell you what they need. Plus, you know, it's okay to cry. It's okay to feel bad. It's okay to, um, you know, to understand that it's a life-threatening disease, but people around you, one of the things that happened to me um, is that, you know, the friendships and the support that came out from every crevice was extraordinary to me, and it was really one of the silver linings for having breast cancer. You know, it was, um, it's a small thing, but it was right before my oldest daughter, who's here, her, it was right before her bat mitzvah, and I needed to get a dress, you know, and so my neighbor, like, took off days from work to help me, and, you know, and it helped make things more celebratory, even though, you know, at that point there were still lots of um, healing to be done um, during that time. So I think, the, I think listen, understand that it's not a linear thing. There'll be ups, there'll be downs. And, um, and it is the, that the kindness of others becomes the silver lining for those of us who either are previvors and, and do what Christy did, which is really change the narrative of her family. I mean, what Christy did and what people who make the very difficult decision to have mastectomies without having breast cancer is they really change history. Um, and I hope that one day it won't take such a huge um, decision to change history, but until that time, you know, that's that's what it really is. So I think it's a very brave thing. And But in terms of family members, I'd say the number one thing is listen, and it's not linear. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I have a, can I ask a literary question? <laughs> um, I'm interested in, you know, you both are very busy. You must have different writing styles. How, how did you split up the writing, and how did you make it feel like one voice in the book? We, we worked as a team, and so we just kind of divided and conquered, and, um, you know, I, I worked a lot on the stories um, because it just, I felt like it was such an important part of the book. Um, and so then she would edit, and then she'd write something and I would edit. And so we just, it was really a true team effort. Um, and we had the help of a, a ghost writer, which I think was what really made it's readable. Um, I'm not sure Simon and Schuster would have signed us without a ghostwriter because doctors write like doctors, kind of like lawyers write like lawyers. <laughs> um, and so I don't think we'd use a ghostwriter for our next book yeah. because I feel like we learned so much. But it was yeah. um, very, uh, the whole process was really very interesting. And it was, you know, um, there. So the things that we were each more expert at, we wrote and the other edited, but we we worked on every chapter together. But I think for, you know, you're right that, you know, we have a day job, we take care of patients, we have very busy clinical practices, you know, we uh, all do community service in many different ways. And I have to say, I was wondering the same thing, but 
One of the things that I learned from writing the book is how gratifying creativity is. You know, like it was there, and and it was um, there would be spurts, right? You know, there'd be times that there was a, a deadline and one of us just, you know, it was really hard to get it done. And then it would just like flow and it felt so good that um, that it allows it allowed me and I think Christy as well to do something that we'd never done before. And you know, one of the other things that the book was so important for is we take care of patients every day. We get the gratification of the one-to-one, -one, but this is an opportunity to impact the lives on a larger scale of more women, women we don't meet one-to-one. -one. And, um, and, you know, and again, the perspective, the unusual perspective that we had really motivated us to share that with more women. But, you know, we, we def it was so wonderful that we definitely want to write another book. We're not sure exactly what that's going to be, but and the 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 bond between us, you know, we're perfect partners. So if you go into Christie's desk, she doesn't have one piece of paper on her desk. If you come into my desk, uh, it's piled high and the most disorganized thing you've ever seen. And I think that's emblematic that we each brought something very different to the table, and we appreciated each other's strength and just have the utmost respect for each other. So if anything, you know, it definitely brought us closer and, you know, I have no interest in writing a book by myself. I just, it's gotta be with Christy, so. Um. I'm very deadline oriented. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> so it was, it was a, you know, it was really a perfect c combination, but I think um, we, I feel like we've learned so much from writing this book, um, not about medicine, but, um, about the responses that we get from people. I was like in a little shopping center um, near my house not too long ago, and I brought the book in for the, a woman, the woman I know who owns the little local shop, and I put it on the counter, and someone came up, and she goes, oh my God, that's, you know, I just got diagnosed with breast cancer, and that's on my nightstand, and I can't tell you how much that helps me. So I, I, I think um, there's so many wonderful things about being an author, uh, and impacting others. And, you know, as a doctor, that kind of creativity, we've both written so many scientific papers, and that is really formulaic, right? You know, introduction, materials and methods, results, discussion, right? We, but this was, um, you know, really let, like, let creative juices flow, and it was awesome. It was a part of us that we otherwise wouldn't have known, or certainly I wouldn't have. So you said you added a chapter because um, your husband had asked you about the caregiver. Um, in reflecting in all these podcasts and conversations you've been having, is there a chapter that is not in the book that you feel like uh, you'd like to put in? We forgot a chapter for male breast cancer. And I'd say, I don't know that there's chapters I want to add, but there's things I want to change. I mean, the screening controversy, so much has changed even since the book was published in May, the USPSTF. I mean, I'd love to add more and even be more adamant and um, zealous about the current USPSTF recommendations. Um, and, you know, there are some other technologies that I wish I had added. So, like, um, we have a very dear friend who's a leader in biomedical engineering, tissue engineering, and I was telling him about the book after it was published, and he said to me, you know, we could build a scaffold of the breast and put a woman's own, it's not here now, so her own tissue, she could like, you could build another breast from your own tissue instead of taking it from stomachs or backs or, so I think, you know, there's so much that it's so quickly changing um, that I would wish I could add the things that have changed since May, you know, so. Well, if, um, want to thank all of you for your attention. Um, was there another question? Oh, this is a, okay, please, sorry. Why, why did you start, why did you start early? That is such wow. a good question. And, and actually, that is mentioned in the book about we start mammograms 10 years before the age of diagnosis. Um, for women with a family history of breast cancer. So if your mother was diagnosed at the age of 40, we start mammograms at the age of 30. And for women with a genetic mutation, we start MRIs at the age of 25 and mammograms in between the MRIs once she t turns 30. So that's an amazing question. 
And the other reason is because there is very little radiation, but there is a little bit of radiation in a mammogram. And so uh, the risk of cancer is very low and the risk of radiation to a younger breast is higher. So we wait until the risk of finding, uh, the, the likelihood of having a cancer and using the radiation from a mammogram is worth that risk. So let me just put it in perspective. You get more radiation flying to California four times than you do from a mammogram, and I'm, I'd be happy to go to California four times, right? Who wouldn't? So it's very, very low, but we still have to be responsible in all of medicine. We have to be responsible for everything we do to make sure we don't hurt anybody. That's a great question. So we need change, you know, we need change. We need change in the USPSTF, we need change in organizations. We need uh, to, to really impact healthcare disparity. We can't do that without legislation. And, um, you know, even today we had a congressional briefing um, that uh, uh, Rosa DeLauro uh, in her opening remarks said, Congress listens, right? Congress is a changing body and that listens to voices. And so we need funding for research. We need funding to eliminate healthcare disparities. We need funding to um, help women with dense breasts so that we can save more lives. And we've done a lot, right? The, the PALS Act, the, you know, according to Medicare, um, the USPSTF is the only thing that's covered. And the USPSTF was simply wrong, no doubt about it, and continues to be wrong. Better, but still wrong. But um, the PALS Act is one of the beautiful things of, um, of cooperation across the aisle, largely by women in Congress across the aisle, that said, no, we're not going to follow the recommendations of the PALS Act. We're going to cover mammography, no cost to the patient, um, uh, no copay, no deductible, and they reappropriate for the PALS Act every year. But the other thing we need to do is find out other barriers. So at the Brem Foundation, we found, um, actually Andrea Wolf, when she was the CEO of the Brem Foundation, found that uh, transportation to free mammograms was a hindrance. You could give underserved women free mammograms, but if they can't get there, um, they're not gonna get life-saving mammograms. So we started this really cool program called Wheels for Women, where um, we partner with Lyft and at no cost to the patient, we work with federally funded health service system or centers um, and take the women to their free mammograms for free so they can actually get life-saving screening mammograms. But now we need funding for the additional diagnostic tests and the additional screening in women with dense breasts. So we're making baby steps forward and also just you know, um, have 36 states in the District of Columbia have laws that require women to be told what their breast density is. So it's again empowering women with knowledge and also educating them on what they need um, to be optimally treated and to raise their voice. Any other questions? Okay, well, we have books um, in the back and. Um, our guests are going to sign the books too in, in the room adjacent to here. And I want to thank you both very much, both personally. <laughs>